Open your uh, Bibles, if you would, to Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1, and also, you might want to mark off John, chapter 1. And if you're really feeling aggressive, you can mark off Hebrews, chapter 1. I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, And while you're finding your way there, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you so much for what you've done for us. Light into darkness, the incarnation. You gave us life. You came to save us from our sins. We can never repay you. And we never get tired of talking about and remembering what you've done for us. We love you so much. We praise you. As we look at those things and prepare our hearts for the Christmas season, Lord, we pray that you would come and guide and lead and instruct us here today as we look at what you have said about the virgin birth and your word. We give you this time. Open our eyes. Illuminate your word for us. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Real quick, everybody knows that John had the surgery that he had again. So, uh, you know, there was a problem with the surgery. Things weren't in place properly. He had the surgery on Friday. Uh, He wanted me to let you know that everything went well, and he's doing well. He's got good range of motion. Uh, And so... Uh, He also wants to thank you very much for your prayers, for your many emails and texts and so on. Uh, And uh, just keep, please continue to keep praying for he and Renee as well um, as they're, uh, she's a little sick today and uh, he's recuperating and he's going to have, you know, uh, physical therapy and all that kind of stuff. So keep praying for him if you would, but so far so good. So praise God for that. Uh, So Can you imagine that Christmas is two weeks and one day away? You realize that? Two weeks and one day away. What what happened? How did we get here? Here we are. Time flies. It's an amazing thing. So remember, like Max said, two weeks from today is Christmas Eve. And because it's Sunday, we're doing regular services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So don't show up at 1, 3, or 5 like we did last year because we won't be here. So make sure you show up at the right times. Uh, So today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 begins with the genealogy uh, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, And so uh, we're we're not going to look at that whole genealogy. We'll just look at a few parts of it. Uh, There's also uh, that that genealogy, the one in Matthew chapter 1, is Joseph's adopted line through Joseph, right? The genealogy through Joseph. In Luke chapter 3, you also have uh, another genealogy, which is through Mary's line, going all the way back to Abraham. We're not going to look at that today either. Uh, But what we we are going to do is take a look at uh, another genealogy, which I would call his eternal genealogy. Through uh, in in, uh, John chapter 1, Um, so that we can see that Jesus is, in fact, God. So turn with me to John chapter 1. Very familiar passage. Most of us know this passage. And so it says in verse 1, John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through Him, and without Him, Nothing was made that was made. And in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we have the eternal genealogy of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was Jesus Christ, the Word. And He was with God. And he was God, and he is God, and he'll always be God. He has no beginning and he has no end uh, because he is God himself. He's eternal. Before we go any further and look at the genealogy, uh, we're really not going to read through it in Matthew, 
uh, just realize that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says this. <laughs> Let me get there first. And then I'll tell you what it says. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he made appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So once again, Jesus Christ made everything. He made everything, just like it says in John chapter 1 and here in Hebrews chapter 1. And it goes on to say, who being the brightness of his glory. In other words, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at right hand of the majesty on high, which is where Jesus is seated right now. Jesus is indeed God. And he came to earth and he took on flesh to be like one of us so he could relate to him with the single goal to go to the cross and die on the cross for your sins. And we're going to look at that today. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at a couple different things today. We're going to look at uh, uh, the purpose that Jesus came to save us from our sin. We're going to look at the virgin birth, how it came to be. We're going to look at the fact that God is with us, Emmanuel, God is with us. And we're going to look at the obedience of Joseph and Mary today after the angels appeared to both of them and told them uh, that, go ahead, this is of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at all those things today. But back to Jesus being eternal. It says in Colossians that in him, through him, by him, all things were created and in him all things consist that he's before all things, that he's over all things, and that he has the preeminence. It says in Colossians chapter 2 that in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and in him we are complete. We have everything we need in him. I don't know if there's anything more I could say. There is a lot more I could say, but you get the idea. Jesus is God, and he's the express image of God. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at the Father. Jesus would say in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said in John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. So remember now, there's one God. But that one God is a triune God. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. Not three gods, one God, three persons. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Spirit is God. Not three gods, one God, three persons. Are you confused yet? It, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around the concept. And I'm not going to teach on the Trinity today. But just remember, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. One God, three persons. Because we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit today. Remember, He, the Holy Spirit, is not an impersonal force. He is God. So back to Matthew now. Matthew chapter 1. It says, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. In other words, this is Jesus' genealogy through the line of Joseph. And, and the whole idea of this genealogy is to prove that Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham. Why? Because the Messiah must be the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, you might remember that the Lord made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, saying, in your seed, the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And by that, it was understood that from Abraham's seed, the Messiah would come. So anyone who would claim to be the Messiah would have had to come through uh, the line of Abraham a seed of Abraham. And then later on, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a promise to David that he would build his house and that his seed, Jesus, would sit on his throne, King David's throne, forever. And David understood that God was promising that the Messiah would come 
through his line. So you understand, that's the whole purpose of this genealogy. I'm not going to read it all for you. You can read it over yourself and mispronounce all the words yourself. Uh, but uh, these genealogies are typically uh, um, all men. But it's interesting, in this genealogy, four women are included. That never happens in a genealogy. So genealogies usually go like this. You know, uh, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac, Isaac begot Joseph, and so on. It's all men. But in this particular genealogy, there's four women listed. In verse 3, verse 5, and verse 6, um, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Now, three of these four women are immoral women. And isn't that interesting that Jesus would include three women Immoral women. Tamar, she played the harlot. Rahab was a harlot. <laughs> uh, Ruth, now she was a Moabite. She wasn't an immoral woman, but uh, she was grafted in because she married Boaz, right? And then Bathsheba, she committed adultery. Why would God include these women in, his, in this genealogy about Jesus Christ being uh, the son of God? and being the Messiah. Well, I think he included it because he wants to show us that he can redeem anybody and he will redeem anybody. Anybody who's willing to come to him. It says in Ti Titus chapter 2, verse 14, that Jesus gave himself that we might be redeemed from every lawless deed and to purify us for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works, don't ever think God can't use you. He can redeem anybody, and he can use anybody. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We're so used to hearing that. But the old me died 27, almost 27 years ago, and I became a new creation in Christ. And if God could redeem me, <laughs> he can redeem anybody. You didn't know me before Christ. I did, though. You know, I know what he's done. And if he could use me and redeem me, he can use anybody. You don't have to live in our past failures. We're new creations in Christ. And I think that's what God had in mind by putting these four women in this genealogy. See, we can walk with joy. We can walk with purpose in Christ. Like Tamar, like uh, Ruth and Bathsheba and Rahab. God will use you because he's a merciful and gracious God. He can use anybody who will come to him and receive that free gift. So that's the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Joseph's line. Joseph is his adoptive father because God really is his father. Okay? So in verse 18 of Matthew... It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now this word betrothed, it simply means they're engaged, but it means more than what we understand to be engaged. Today we get engaged, somebody gets engaged, and if they decide after a while, they, uh, I don't want to marry you, they say, I'm calling the whole thing off. And they give back the ring, or maybe they don't give back the ring. <laughs> Sometimes that happens too. I've seen it. Uh, and, and it's over. It's done. I'm not going to marry you. That's not what this is. This is a binding contract. To be throwed means you are bound. There would be a ceremony at the uh, um, bride's uh, home, and uh, the bridegroom would sign a contract. There'd be witnesses that would sign a contract. Uh, and and the, the groom would give the bride something of value to sort of seal the deal, the guarantee that I am actually going to go through with this and marry you. And the bride would typically be in her teens when this happens. Very different than our culture, you know, where now uh, young, young people get married 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, you know, teenager. They were in their teens, during this time when you're betrothed, by the way, uh, it would last about a year or so, and, and the bride during that year would be preparing her, her clothes, <coughs> excuse me, 
her jewelry, just getting everything just right for when her bridegroom would come for her. The bridegroom, on the other hand, would go to his father's house. And there at his father's house, he was preparing everything, the festivities, preparing a place there either in the house or in addition onto the house or on the property uh, for them to live in together. He's preparing everything. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. My father's house, there are many dwellings. I go to prepare a place for you and I'll come again and receive you to myself so that where you are, I am there, I, there you'll be also. Um, very interesting because uh, the traditional Jewish wedding is a good picture of our relationship with Christ. Right now, we're betrothed to Jesus Christ. One day, they'll, we'll be married. And then in the next verse, it says this. Um, so right now, first of all, let's understand, they are in this period of being betrothed. They're not officially married yet. They haven't come together and they're not living together because the bridegroom's preparing a place for that. They haven't been intimate with each other yet, but Mary's been found with child. Uh-oh. So in verse 19, it says, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, which means he's an upright man, he's a godly man, he's a devout man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Notice, notice it says Joseph's her husband. So this disagreement was so binding that there continued to be husband and wife at this point, which means if he wanted to put her away, that's a nice way of saying divorce her, he would have to get her certificate of divorce. He couldn't just say, I don't want to marry you anymore. Not in that culture. That's not how it worked. He would have to get a certificate of divorce. So uh, here's Mary, right? She's supposed to be a virgin. And we know, we know she is a virgin. And we know she's pregnant of the Holy Spirit. But Joseph doesn't know that. And I don't know exactly what she told Joseph, but he must have had a lot of questions, don't you think? What did you do? Who did this? You could just imagine all the things that were going on here between them. And he's trying to figure it out. He knows that because they are considered to be husband and wife, this would be adultery if she was with a man. If she was with a man. And you know what happens what the penalty is for adultery, right? You'd be stoned to death. Now, Joseph is an upright man. He's a good man. He's a devout man. And he doesn't want her to be stoned to death. He's trying to figure out what to do. So he starts thinking, well, maybe I can just kind of put her away secretly somehow. Slip her out of here. Nobody will ever know. Um, I don't think Joseph gets enough credit, you know. He's a good man. He's a good guy. We usually only look at him around Christmas time, but he's a good guy. And while he's thinking about all these things, in verse 20, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Apparently he fell asleep, and now he's having a dream. And the angel says to him, maybe, maybe Gabriel, I don't know, because Gabriel appeared to Mary as well. So maybe it's Gabriel, we're not told. But the angel says this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Underline that in your Bible. Do not be afraid. Because you're going to hear that a couple times. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So again, he has this dream while he's trying to figure out what to do. This angel appears to him. Like I said, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Mary, you're highly favored. You're blessed. You found favor with God and told her that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and overshadow her so that she'll be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So the Mary, Mary already knows that she's with child by the Holy Spirit. So now this angel appears to him and says, don't be afraid. Go ahead and take Mary to be your wife because she is, in fact, a virgin. And she has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, whatever she told you, she's telling you the truth, Joseph. And so verse 21 says, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus 
for he will save his people from their sins. Now, this name, Jesus, common name back in those days, Jesus uh, or Joshua or Yeshua, right? And it simply means Jehovah is salvation or Savior or just Deliverer. So his name is Jesus, which means Savior. He came to save us from our sins. Now, this idea of being saved from our sins. It's saved from the penalty of sin. I think we all understand that. What's the penalty of sin? Hell, right? So uh, the penalty of sin would be hell, but because Jesus paid the price for our sins, we don't go to hell. Instead, we know that we have everlasting life in heaven because of what he's done for us on the cross. But we're not only saved from the penalty of sin, we're also saved from the power of sin. It says in <coughs> Romans chapter 6 that we're no longer slaves of sin, that we're no longer in bondage under sin, that sin no longer has a hold on us, that we can now reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, sin doesn't have power over us. Before <coughs> salvation, you know, we were steeped in sin and our flesh ruled. But when we come to Christ, our sin is forgiven, we're set free, and now we can actually walk in the Holy Spirit and not walk in sin any longer. We've been freed from the power of sin, and we've also, and ultimately will be, freed from the presence of sin. One day, when we get to heaven, we'll be free. We won't have to deal with the sin nature, our flesh, any longer. Boy, I look forward to that, don't you? I mean, that's why it says in Galatians, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, because the spirit and the flesh are against one another. Right? The, lust, the spirit lusts against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, and they're contrary to one another, so that we do not do the things that we wish. But those days will be gone when we get to heaven. We won't have to deal with that anymore. No more evil, no more guilt, no more shame. All that sin is will be set free from it. Jesus came to do all these things for us, to set us free, to save us from our sins. That's why it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, nor there is, is there salvation in any other name, because there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus died on the cross so our sins could be forgiven. He rose again from the dead so that we could have everlasting life. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. No one can go to heaven except through me. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, go to hell, but instead have everlasting life in heaven. You see, Jesus paid the price for our sins. He came to save us for our sins. Why are you harping on this? Well, because <laughs> this is what it's all about. This is what... Jesus came, this is what the incarnation is all about. God left heaven, he came down to earth, he took on flesh, and he became like one of us. So yes, he could identify with us. He grew up amongst us, right? He was tempted in all points, and yet without sin. But the ultimate mission was to go to the cross and die for our sins. So our sins could be forgiven. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. So all of this, verse 22, was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, 
Isaiah 714 is on a lot of the Christmas cards that you see this time of year. And so is uh, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse, uh, what is it, 6 and 7. Uh, so those two are the big ones, right? We see them all the time. So uh, in Isaiah 714, it says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin birth is a sign. A sign of what? Well, of a divine birth or the incarnation. And so it's not only a sign, it's a downright miracle. I mean, have you ever heard of a virgin getting pregnant? No. It's never happened before, and it'll never happen again. It happened one time in all of history. It's a miracle. It's a sign. We get so used to hearing these things, so we just kind of read right through them. But imagine that. Imagine that. It's a sign from God. It's a miracle that he would be uh, born of a virgin. So Mary is the biological mother. Joseph is the adopted father. So his name is Jesus. And Jesus tells us his mission to save us from our sins. But his first name isn't Jesus and his last name is Christ. <laughs> his name is Jesus. He doesn't have a last name. Christ is his title uh, or Messiah. They mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. Messiah comes from the Hebrew. Christ comes from the, uh, from the Greek. But they mean the same thing, anointed one. So the Messiah or Christ means anointed one. Perhaps you remember in Luke chapter 4 when we were there a few months back or so, uh, Jesus came into his hometown, Nazareth, and he was, uh, on the day of the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. He opened it up and began to read from uh, Isaiah 61. He found the place. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to set the captives free. And then he closed the scroll. And he said, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, it was a messianic prophecy about the Messiah. And Jesus said, here I am. I'm in fulfillment of this. So Messiah, or Christ, is his title. And then the word Emmanuel which means God with us, describes who he is. He's God with us. We looked at that very well in John chapter 1 and Hebrews and so on. So God is with us, and it's not a new concept. It didn't just happen when Jesus was born. All throughout human history, God has been with his people. At different times, in different ways, he was with Abraham. He was with Isaac, with Jacob with Moses, with Joshua, uh, David, and Enoch, and you, you name it. He was with his people. He's always been with his people because God created us in his image to be like him. He wants fellowship with us, and he wants to work in our lives. However, today, Jesus is not only with us, but he's in us under the new covenant. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I and the Father will love you. I'm sorry, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father that he would send another helper. Another is the word allos in the Greek, another like me. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit, who's also God. I will send another helper. And then Jesus said, he is with you, but he will be in you and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. So today, uh, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he dwells within you. So not only is he with you, but he's also in you. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. He'll always be with us. And this is really good news, especially if you're going through a difficult time or a hard time. Where is God? He's in you. <laughs> He'll always be with you. He wants to minister to your heart. 
It does say in James chapter 4, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Isn't that interesting? He's so near that he's in us, but we still need to draw near to him sometimes. Why? Well, we can ignore the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us, right? And so even though he's with us, even though he's in us, we need to lean into him. I say that because some people, uh, when Christmas time comes, we get so excited with all the, the wrappings and the trappings that we lose sight of the whole purpose for Christmas. You know, to remember that Jesus, the incarnation, took on flesh, came into the world. It's easy to do that. I also say this because Christmas brings up a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Some people just enjoy the, the time and lean into the Lord. Other people lose sight of Jesus. Some people are just downright hurting this time of year for various reasons. Some people, when Christmas comes around, it just conjures up memories of somebody that you lost. That's hard. God is with you. God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is with you through all of that. God is with you. So Jesus saves. The Messiah is the anointed one, and that's, that's his official title, and he's with us forever. And one day he's going to sit on the throne of David forever because he's the seed of David, and he will sit on the throne of David, as we looked at earlier. That's never happened yet. That will happen when he comes back to earth at the second coming and uh, Satan is thrown into a bottomless pit and then we go into the thousand year reign of Christ and he will sit on the throne of David one day. So, in verse 24, after all this, it says that Joseph was aroused from his sleep and then he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took to him his wife. And I really love this picture because Joseph decided to obey. He didn't have to obey, but he decided to obey. Obedience isn't always easy, is it? In our culture and in that old culture in many different ways, what we live in today is very different than what he lived in then. And I don't know how much he understood being a teenager about what his decision to obey would mean. But I can tell you right now, we have the completed Bible and we know, we understand, this would be scandalous. This would be outrage. They would be ostracized in their hometown of Nazareth. Um... I don't know how much they understood when they agreed to obey. But the angel appeared. Now, of course, an angel appeared to him, and that doesn't happen every day either. So when an angel appears and tells you that, you know, your, your wife is impregnated by the Holy Spirit, you tend to kind of perk up a little bit. But nonetheless, he woke up and he did exactly as the angel of the Lord told him to do. He obeyed. And so did Mary, by the way. Mary said, that she only had one question. Uh, how could this be since I don't know a man? In other words, I'm a virgin. How could this be? How can I give birth to Jesus? And then the angel Gabriel explained to her that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and overshadow her. She'll be impregnated. And uh, he said to her, with God, nothing's impossible. And then... She said, this is her response, let it be to me as you have sa said. I am your maid servant. Dule in the Greek, which means I am a servant by choice. I choose to do your will is what she was saying. So they both were willing to be obedient. How much did they understand? I don't know, but they would be ostracized. Later on, during Jesus' public ministry in John chapter 8, he was uh, 
he was in confrontation with some of the religious leaders, imagine that. Uh, and so uh, during the confrontation, he was basically saying, you're not, you're not of God, and you're not, Abraham is not your father, biologically he's your father, but you want to kill me. <laughs> Abraham didn't do that, and he was, he was calling them out. And they said to him, well, we have one father. We're not born of fornication, right? So it got out, and everybody knew that Jesus would have been born of fornication, right? You can't keep something like that quiet. So it would have been a scandal, yet they obeyed. They were willing to obey. How much did they understand? I don't know. But they were willing to obey. It reminds me of Acts chapter 5, when Peter and the apostles were standing before the religious leaders and being threatened a second time for preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, preaching uh, the gospel. And so Peter looked at them and he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly it. You ought to obey God rather than man, even if it's going to be hard. See, as Christians, we are salmon. We're swimming against the flow all the time. The world is going this way, and, uh, and, and usually we're going in a completely the opposite direction. And it's not always easy. Today, it's not easy to stand firm in your faith. There's so many things coming against what we stand for as Christians, as believers in Christ. But look, here's the deal. I'd rather be a God pleaser than a man pleaser any day. I'd rather have harmony with God and friction with man than friction with God and harmony with man. Right? They obeyed. I admire that. So it says here in, in verse 24, Joseph being aroused from sleep did in fact obey or, or did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. They did exactly what the Lord told them to do. And so as I close this message out, and the band makes their way back up here, uh, Jesus came on a mission. And the simple mission, as we've looked at, thoroughly here today, is he came to save his people from their sins. And so, there'll be prayer partners up here at the end of the service, and you'll have an opportunity to come up if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receive him as your Savior and your Lord. You see, the greatest gift ever given is the gift of salvation. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not of a work. No work that we could do. It's a gift from God. Now, for that gift transaction to be complete, somebody has to say, here's a gift for you, and you have to say, okay, I want it, and take it back. If you don't take it, then the gift can't, the tra transaction can't be completed, can it? And so the gift has been offered to you, to everybody. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my simple question for you is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Perhaps you've heard the gospel, the good news before, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. But you haven't received him yet. What are you waiting for? You see, the simple truth is this, that we need a savior because our sins have separated us from God. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. I'm sure you know the story. And when they sinned, they were separated from God. They were put out of the garden. But God had a plan right then there to reconcile man to himself. You know, that, that Christmas carol we sing, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. 
Peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. God wants us to be reconciled to him into a right relationship that Adam and Eve had once before they sinned. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that Adam sinned, that sin brought death into the world, and that death has spread to all people. So we're all infected, so to speak, with the virus of sin. And Jesus came to save us from our sin. The penalty, the power, and ultimately the presence of sin in our lives. And so, as we stand and sing this next song, and you may stand, I'm not going to do an altar call, but prayer partners will be up here, as I said. During this next song, the prayer partners will come up. If you want to know more about salvation or you're ready to say, yes, I, what am I waiting for? I want to receive Jesus Christ right now as my Lord and Savior. Come on up and just let one of them know, and they'd be happy to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ today as Lord and Savior, the greatest gift ever given. Or if you want to talk to me, I'll be out in the foyer somewhere come on out, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Either answer questions or pray with you to receive Christ as Lord and Savior.